All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. All right, all right. All right, all right. so first off, let me get the sign-in sheet passed around. we we'll start that with you. Um, some quick announcements. Um, so homework one, that's due on Tuesday, September the 5th. Um, I thought I'd throw uh, just a couple hints at you to um, make the math a little simpler, at least for the first problem. Uh, uh, it's going to involve some mechanics uh, of deformable bodies that I know you all are, are, as soon as I say that, you're having a hard time containing your excitement over it. Um, but I wanted to uh, illustrate some basic uh, uh, calculations with you. So um, at least with the first problem, uh, we know that just from what we talked about in here, that at least in the linear range, that stress and strain are related. Uh, uh, they are linearly proportional to one another, and that constant of linear proportionality is what we call Young's modulus, the elastic modulus. Now, stress, stress is defined as P over A, and then the strain is defined as the change in length over the original length. So just doing a little bit of algebra, you can solve for the change in length, which is PL over EA. Is that familiar from deformables? I, I've got to believe that that's familiar, that you've done that before. Okay, now this is the change in length. Okay, that is not the final length or, or the initial length. So like the final length of a given element would be its initial length plus or minus how much it, it deforms. Now I say plus or minus because it depends on whether or not you're pulling on it or pushing on it. So that's something to keep in mind. Now that uh, is the, okay, That'll, uh, t this is all involving strain in the longitudinal direction over here. If you're wanting strain in the lateral direction, that's where Poisson's ratio comes into play. So um, I'm just going to throw that out there. I have a feeling that if it's been a while for, the first, uh, uh, for that first problem, for the first uh, uh, set of calcs, I wanted to throw that out there to make it a little easier. I don't mind throwing some hints out here and there for stuff that you haven't had since January uh, or, or uh, for, for six months. I'll have a problem with that. For the stuff that we do in here, though, like for instance, like your aggregates homework, I'm probably not going to throw as many hints out. But then again, I don't think that stuff is as challenging either. So I, I think it sort of uh, balances out in the long run. Um, everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, one other thing, uh, make sure that you bring a straight edge on Thursday. Uh, there is a chance we might need it today. I'm not sure. Probably not. Uh, but we'll definitely need it on Thursday with the uh, um, with a sieve analysis that we're going to do. Um, we're going to use it with a gradation chart. Um, depending upon where we're at, I actually have them printed off and on my little cart outside my office. I might get a volunteer to run up and just go grab them for me if we need to use them today. Um, the actual use of the straight edge isn't as big of a deal today as it will be uh, on Thursday. Uh, are we okay with that? And again, closed-toed shoes, don't, don't forget that for Thursday. Um, everybody good with that? Um, one other point that I thought I would mention, um, we're going to have maybe three lectures, maybe four on aggregates, but we're going to have um, three weeks of aggregates lab. Now three weeks of lab constitutes six lectures. Okay, sort of see where I'm getting at? So the point is there might be some days uh, in the next couple weeks where there's really no purpose for us to meet, so we might cancel class. If you look at the syllabus, there are makeup lectures put in there. Now, I put the makeup lectures in there just to make sure that we are on time, but this is one of those classes where being up to date with the, uh, like making sure that the classes and the labs are aligned well is really important. But since we don't have any cement or concrete labs for a while, it might make sense for us to cancel. I also have some travel coming up. So we might try and schedule all that together so we're not really missing anything and we're all uh, up to date and current. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so today I want to talk about uh, aggregates. So, you know, we spent the last couple of times talking about some very fundamental basic uh, uh, properties associated with just materials in general. And I want to talk about specifically about our first material of interest in this course, which is aggregates. Now, we already talked uh, a little bit about some of this in um, uh, last time. But we did it really quick, and I, I want to sort of go in some detail associated with aggregates. And I also brought some sieves that I'm going to pass around because I want you all to get sort of a, a handle on you know, how we 
clap by aggregates and, and the devices that we use. So I brought some sieves and, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So first off, um, like I said last time, I mean aggregates, it's they're the one, of, one of the most fundamental uh, materials that we use in civil engineering and in construction. They tend to serve two main purposes, either uh, an underlying material or filler material in some type of foundation or some type of pavement, um, or they tend to serve as an admixture or a component in uh, 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 materials like concrete uh, or asphalt. So that, that's really the two main uh, uh, applications of aggregates. And those two uh, applications are seen just about everywhere in, in civil engineering applications. What our main focus is going to be uh, for the next couple weeks is to try and understand the properties, the gradation of aggregates. Do they meet, uh, does a given sample of aggregate meet uh, the specification for its intended use? If not, for instance, how do we blend two aggregates together so that we meet specification, uh, et cetera. So that's really going to be our main uh, purpose. Uh, I'm going to skip this because we already talked about this last time, just sources of aggregate, usually, you know, quarries or, or gravel pits or things like that. I'm just, I'm going to sort of uh, skip that. And I'm going to skip the, uh, the, the geological classification uh, stuff. We talked about that uh, last time. Okay. The, um, the, the, I want to start off and I want to get a little more detailed in regards to uh, sieves. So I brought with me uh, a few sieves to give you kind of an idea of, of what um, these are used for. So these are used, and this will become clear throughout the lecture today, these are used to determine the gradation uh, and, uh, of a particular sample uh, of aggregate. Now the first question that we have to ask is, uh, in terms of our classification is are we dealing with a coarse aggregate or are we dealing with a fine aggregate, okay? And uh, you, you'll hear me use the term coarse aggregate and gravel interchangeably and you'll hear me use the term fine aggregate and sand interchangeably. So if you ever hear me use those terms, that's sort of uh, what I'm talking about. Um, we define the difference between a gravel or a sand or a coarse aggregate or fine aggregate based on the size of the individual particles. And there are a series of sieves that we will use throughout our testing, but arguably the most important sieve is this one right here. This is a number four sieve. And a number four sieve is typically the one that is used to delineate the difference between a coarse aggregate and a fine aggregate. So I'm going to pass these around here in a second. This is a number four sieve. I'm actually going to pass this along with it. I have one of those little nifty scales from the uh, engineering board. And uh, if you remember last time, what does the number four mean? Does anybody remember what that means? Four openings per inch. Exactly right. Four openings per inch. That does not mean that those openings are one quarter of an inch wide. Okay? And the reason is these, these wires, they have some thickness to it. If you take um, the 20 scale and you just line it up and just take a look at it, you will see the openings are not quite Five, like they should be, you know, if you're on the 20 scale, then five tick marks would be a quarter of an inch. They're not quite five tick marks wide, but if you look within a given inch, there are four openings. So I wanted to pass this around. I'm going to pass this one. This is a number four scale. I'm going to pass this around. You all can. What's up? Okay. All right. then lab's going to be interesting. <laughs> so, I can... <laughs> yeah. so like I said, um, number four sieve is the one that typically delineates what is a coarse aggregate and what is a fine aggregate. So this will give you an idea of what I mean by a coarse aggregate or a gravel, a fine aggregate or a sand. They each have their particular uses uh, in things like uh, uh, foundation bases or pavement bases or uh, concretes and asphalts. Um, uh, so talking about sieves, just to give you all kind of an idea, again, the number four sieve is sort of the, the big delimiter between um, uh, gravels and sands. But just so everybody's clear on uh, sieve designations, so larger sieves are designated in inches. So a three-inch sieve, a two-and-a-half inch sieve, two-inch sieve. This one right here, this is a three-quarter inch sieve. And you can look, I, I, maybe I should have passed them together, but if you measure those openings from the inside of the wire to the inside of the wire, it's exactly three quarters of an inch. Okay, so this is, a, this is one that would be primarily used for a gravel. So you can see, I mean, it's a lot of, it's a bigger sieve as well. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this one around as well. Maybe I, should I start here? Should I start here? <laughs> 
I'm starting this one with you just to just to be difficult. <laughs> yes, sir. No, no, no. Well, let, uh, number four, uh, it's the smallest number, but it's not the smallest opening. Yeah. Right, just the, bigger the, the bigger the number, the smaller the opening. Yes, but yeah, number four is the smallest number. Is, there, is everybody clear on that? So a larger number would indicate a smaller opening. See this one right here? This is a number 100 sieve. There are 100 openings per inch. I mean, you can't even really see them. It almost feels kind of like a like a fabric-y type thing. So I'm going to pass this one around as well. And I'm starting it with you. <laughs> All right. So is everybody OK on sieve delineations, on designations? Everybody OK with that? OK, those are passing around. Give those a check. You're going to get very familiar with those as the, uh, uh, as the semester progresses. One thing I should also point out, you'll notice when I first brought them in that the number four and the number 100, they were the same diameter. And in fact, they locked together. That's going to be one of the components of what we do in lab. We're going to stack a series of sieves together in what's called a sieve nest. And then that's going to help us determine the gradation of a particular sample of aggregate. Okay? We'll talk about that as we get to it. A um, uh, couple other things. This is more from a terminology standpoint. This is something I would just make note of. These are the types of things that I, I, I want you all to study and be aware of uh, when I ask you uh, on maybe something on an exam. So traditionally, what is the uh, maximum aggregate size and what's the nominal maximum aggregate size? So the maximum aggregate size would be the, um, uh, that first sieve that allows all the material to pass through. So if you've got a stack of sieves, you know, you're going to start to retain material. That first one that allows all the uh, aggregates to pass through, that's going to be the maximum aggregate size. The nominal maximum aggregate size is typically the first sieve that retains some material. Now these are traditional definitions. There are some slight differences with what are called superpave definitions. Superpave is a uh, design methodology that we'll talk about probably near the end of the semester, and it's associated with asphalt. Um, the definitions are a little different. Right now, I'm really more uh, interested that you all understand what the traditional definitions of asphalt are. Uh, and, this, and again, this is one of those things I you know, throw on an exam just to see if you remember. So I use, I use the, the E word, and everybody's like, oh, what? Remember that we don't have exams in my courses. We have celebrations of learning. So just, just be aware of that. Am I good, or you, you all want to hang out here for a second? All right. OK. So some uses for aggregates, again, they tend to provide a basis for things like pavements and foundations. They provide stability to the foundation. They also can serve as filler um, or, or drainage elements. Like, for instance, if you've got a bridge abutment, you know, you'll have your uh, abutment cap, your piles set. Your, uh, you, you'll probably have some, some type of back wall. But between that back wall and where we uh, uh, fill to the end of the road, there's usually some aggregate deposited in there to fill the back of that abutment. So that's one. Uh, particular use of these. Uh, same thing with retaining walls. They can provide an element of drainage, uh, an element of stability, and what have you. But really, the one, uh, two really, really important um, uses of aggregates are, in, are as ingredients or components in elements like uh, concrete or asphalt. And that's really one of the big um, uh, uh, reasons why we're talking about what we're talking about uh, when it comes to aggregates. For, for instance, Later on, we are going to learn how to perform what is called a mixed design. So the idea is, um, for those of you that have already had concrete design, you'll know that you know, when we designed a, a, a beam or a column or a slab or, or what have you, one of our values that we assumed right off the bat was the strength of the concrete. You know, we would design a beam, we'd say, all right, 4 KSI concrete, let's go to work. Well, in here, we are going to learn how to proportion the gravel, the sand, the cement, the water, and all that that goes into that concrete so that we can guarantee it achieves 4 KSI or 5 KSI or what have you. But in order to do that, if I say I'm going to use so much gravel and so much sand, we have to ensure that that gravel and that sand meet specifications. So that's um, uh, our, our main reason behind what we're doing, uh, what we're doing here. Um, <coughs> so. Again, two big uses are uh, Portland cement, concrete, and hot mix asphalt. So aggregate 
Um, ultimately, what aggregate tends to do in, in, in much of these elements is that when you're putting aggregate into the mix, you're reducing uh, the need for as much cement and, and as much water. So more aggregate tends to result in cheaper, uh, cheaper concrete and also concrete that's of a higher quality. And in most cements, the aggregate that takes up uh, a great amount of the volume and the weight, uh, 60 to 75 percent of the volume and uh, something like in, in the 80s uh, in terms of the weight. Oh. So aggregate's a big component of, uh, of, uh, of concrete. It's also a, a big component uh, to the strength and stability of, uh, of hot mix asphalt uh, as well. So just something to be aware of that, that these, uh, I mean, we are literally just talking about gravel and sand, but it makes up a very fundamental component of some very critical construction materials that we use in civil engineering. So that was pretty important. Um, let's talk about some properties of aggregates. So um, if we're talking about a given aggregate, again, our job in here is to try and understand uh, how to classify that aggregate. So there are some properties that we need to know. And the ones I have here in red are the really, really important ones, okay? Uh, moisture state, things like specific gravity, and also gradation. We're going to spend a fair amount of time on gradation. Uh, okay. uh, gradation, uh, by, by that I mean uh, looking at a sieve analysis. If, if, if I ever say sieve analysis or gradation analysis, it's the same thing. I'll probably just say sieve analysis since it's a little easier to get out. But I'm essentially talking about the same thing. Now there are a, a fair, a, a larger number of uh, properties that are also important, like uh, toughness, shape of the, the uh, aggregate, uh, strength modulus, what have you. Uh, and some of those um, properties are more important than others dependent upon your given application. For instance, let's look at uh, physical properties. So one of the physical properties might be something like specific gravity. You all remember what specific gravity is, right? How heavy a given element is in comparison to water, right? So if you have a specific gravity of two, it's twice as heavy as water, right? So if I look here, if I look at, let's say, physical properties and specific gravity, specific gravity is very important to something like Portland cement concrete. That's very important. But for asphalt concrete or as a base material for a foundation or pavement, it's moderately important. Some of these properties, uh, for instance, um, let's look at this, integrity during heating, okay? Not really the biggest deal in concrete, but it's much more important in asphalt. Asphalt has to retain a certain temperature uh, in order to set, so that property obviously matters a little bit more in that application. Make sense? Okay, so we've got you know, physical properties that we're interested in. We've also got chemical properties uh, that we're interested in, you know, solubility, surface charge. Don't worry, this is not going to be a chemistry class repeat. Everybody's seen chemistry and they went, hold on. I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not so bad. Um, but there are some chemical properties that are important. I mean, you know, when you're mixing concrete, there is a chemical reaction that does uh, take place. So you need to ensure that your aggregate and your uh, ingredients that go into that mix uh, meet those uh, required chemical properties. There's also a series of mechanical properties that are going to matter, uh, you know, things like compressive strength, abrasion resistance, uh, uh, toughness, uh, and what have you. Um, these, these come right out of your book. I, I would recommend that you give them the, uh, the once over just to make sure you have a general idea. You know, if you're mixing uh, concrete or an asphalt, what's important, what's not important. Okay. Um, I am going to go through a few of them. These are some things that we are going to discuss. Uh, in Some of them we're going to discuss in lab. Some of them we're not. Um, so one of them that's going to be kind of important is the particle uh, shape, the surface texture. Do we have particles that are angular? Are they rounded? Um, do we have elongated elements? Because th these ultimately change. I mean, we're talking about things like the, the, the strength of these elements, their surface area. And these are all impacted if you're trying to design something like a concrete mix. I mean, think these volumes could have, or the, these particles could all have similar volumes. But if they have different surface areas, they're going to bond in that concrete mix uh, differently. So that's going to change the mobility of that mix, uh, sometimes called the workability. Um, so, you know, this stuff matters, and we're going to do some classification uh, of these aggregates um, in labs. This is just something to be aware of. Um, so, things like angularity, I mean, this would be a, a, a 
They're angular aggregate. You can see it's sort of blocky. It's got sort of very sharp edges and sharp corners. It's going to behave differently in a concrete mix than stone that's very rounded. This is going to be a much more workable concrete uh, than this one. So does that make sense? I'm going to give you all uh, a sample of this in lab or you're going to have a series of materials and you're going to need to classify them as angular, rounded, uh, somewhere in between. That's something uh, I think we're going to do Thursday. If not Thursday, definitely next Thursday. I've got to go back to the, to the lab schedule and check on that. <coughs> uh, flatness and, and elongation. Flatness, how flat are the individual particles? So basically one dimension uh, with respect to its thickness. Elongation, uh, one dimension with respect to the other. They could be flat and elongated. These are going to uh, matter throughout a concrete mix because the more flat and elongated a given particle is, the easier that that particle is to break apart. And that can cause difficulty uh, with mixing concrete. It can definitely cause a difficulty uh, in compaction if you're trying to compact uh, an aggregate for a base for something like a, a, a pavement or, or a, a base for a, a roadway or something. That's definitely going to matter uh, as well. Uh, some other uh, uh, aspects, you know, surface texture. Surface texture is obviously going to matter uh, for bonding with, with uh, uh, fillers, things like asphalts and concretes, uh, also looking at it from a coarse aggregate and a fine aggregate uh, standpoint. One thing I'll mention, um, there's something on this slide here that I don't think has been in any of the other slides that we've seen this semester, and that's this little ASTM thing here on the uh, right. Uh, ASTM stands for, for the American Society for Testing and Materials. And what they do is they publish standards for how to assess the quality of a given material. And it, it ranges all over the place from construction materials to plastics to inks to, to paper to you name it. Okay? And they are essentially the standard that defines, you know, if you know, let I brought an example here to give you kind of an idea. Um, for instance, if I'm looking at this Sharpie, you know, the ink in this Sharpie has to conform to given standards. You look here at the Sharpie, you'd be surprised. This Sharpie conforms to ASTM 4, what was that, D4286 or something like that. This ink has undergone quality assurance uh, and quality control such that it meets specifications. We're obviously more interested in the specifications associated with aggregates, with concrete, with steel alloys and things like that. But what these standards do is they delineate what are the thresholds that need to be met, how do you perform the laboratory experiments, and how do you collect the data to assess these materials. We're, let me be clear, we're not going to go through every single ASTM standard, but some of them we are going to go through, and some of them I do expect that you're able to read them, negotiate them, and understand them. And, and I'm, I'm thinking what we're probably going to do is we'll probably do a lab experiment or two, then go back and look at the ASTM standard, and you can see how we were following it. Then when later on we do something like our concrete test, you'll go, oh, okay, now I see what's going on, and it's a little easier, uh, little easier to follow. But we'll, we'll make fair use of these ASTM standards throughout the semester. Not really a big deal right now, but it will be uh, to come. Um, <laughs> some tests that I just wanted to bring up, we're not going to perform these tests uh, in this class. We don't have time to perform every single uh, uh, laboratory test uh, associated with every single material. We've got to choose the ones that are the, uh, the most important. But some of these uh, are obviously going to be important when you're uh, doing something like mixing concrete or mixing an asphalt or using a, 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 an aggregate in some type of app, uh, civil engineering application. One of them is to look at things like aggregates resistance to weathering or its resistance to corrosion or, or uh, salt type materials. You know, one test uh, looking at ASTM C88. You know, for instance, you take a mass of a sample. You'll take that sample. This is a perfect example of an ASTM test. You'll uh, determine the mass of a sample. You'll take that sample and you'll soak it in a, a, a solution, sodium uh, sulfate or magnesium sulfate. You'll soak it for a period of time. You'll dry it and then you'll repeat it over and over again. And is that after performing, uh, you know, this soaking cycle, you know, five cycles, the idea is that over time some of that aggregate will react and wear away. So it'll give you kind of a, a measurement of before and after how much of that aggregate was lost under these conditions. And that'll then give you an idea of does this aggregate meet specifications or not 
for the application that you're looking at. This is a perfect example of an ASTM standard. Okay. Everybody okay with this? This idea? Okay. Um, here's another one. This is looking at uh, abrasion resistance. Uh, you might uh, hear this referred to in your book as the Los Angeles abrasion test. So the idea behind this is this is a perfect one for something like, a, like an asphalt. Uh, this is really important because you're looking at uh, the performance under, of an aggregate under um, a repeated cycle of loading. So the idea is this. You take an aggregate and you put it in this rotating drum that you see here on the bottom. And you basically have these steel sort of spherical, I mean, there's these steel, standard steel uh, balls that go into the, uh, into the drum. The drum starts to rotate. So what are those steel balls going to do to the aggregate, to the gravel? I mean, think, you've got these big heavy steel balls in a drum and it's rotating like this. What are they going to do to the aggregate? They're going to crush it a little bit, right? So the idea is that they're going to crush it. You know, this is what it would look like before. This is probably going to look what it looks like, what's going to look like after. There's a sieve inside there that's separating the smaller particles out. So the idea is you perform this test, record a mass before and a mass after, and the idea is you'll get an idea of the abrasion resistance of that particular aggregate. And that's going to matter depending upon the, uh, the application. If you're looking at an asphalt pavement, that's probably going to matter. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So again, just another one of those um, factoids that you're asking, you know, what is a Los Angeles abrasion test? Now you have a general idea. One of those uh, celebratory questions that might come up. So, okay. All right. Now I'm going to take some time and sort of dig into some stuff that we really are going to look at. I mean, the stuff I was talking about up until now, I mean, I wanted you to have an idea, but we're not, like I said, we're not going to perform every single laboratory test that, that, that's in existence. We've got to pick and choose the ones that are the most important. Um, so we, not only do we have to pick and choose the tests that are the most important, we also have to pick and choose the properties and the, uh, the concepts that are the most important. So this is a big one. I want to take some time and talk about moisture state. You know, looking at a given aggregate, if I'm going to take an aggregate and I'm going to use it in something uh, like a concrete or, or an asphalt or something, one very, very important property of that uh, aggregate is its moisture state. You know, we, we, you're thinking about gravel, you know, maybe your first thought is, oh, we're just talking about dry, you know, crushed rock or something like that. Well, its moisture state uh, is really going to impact, you know, what it's used for, especially if it's used for something like concrete. I mean, I mean think about it like this. One of the main uh, ingredients uh, in a mixture of concrete is water. Well, if the aggregate already had some moisture associated with it, well, theoretically, you wouldn't need as much water, right? But if you don't know how much uh, moisture uh, is present, then that can cause some issues. So you need to have a general idea of um, moisture states for a given, ag uh, given aggregate. And I propose that there's really four that we really need to consider. So the first one is dry. So a dry aggregate, and we're going to deal with dry aggregates in the lab, but a dry aggregate is one that we assume to be absolutely completely dry. So one of the ways that we're going to assess that in the lab is we're going to have samples of aggregates. We're going to take that aggregate and literally place it in an oven and leave it there overnight. And that oven is going to heat away all of that moisture so that the next day when we collect the, uh, the, the data off of the sample, the weight of, uh, off of that sample, we can assume that that sample is quote unquote dry. So remember when I said uh, on Thursday that you all need to quote unquote elect a representative to be able to go and collect data in the lab? We're going to try and keep the lab open uh, on Friday, but I, I am going to need to get those names off of you sometime before, uh, probably before the end of this week. Um, <clears throat> but when you uh, come back in and, and get your sample, one of the big things that you're going to be after is dry weights. So what we might do in the lab is we might say, okay, let's say we have uh, uh, a, a sample with some unknown moisture. So we know we've got some wet gravel. So we'll weigh the gravel. We'll take that gravel. We'll put it in the oven let it heat up overnight, when we come back and weigh it again, now we've got dry gravel. So if we take the weight of the wet gravel, subtract it from the weight of the dry gravel, what does that give us? The weight of the water, okay? Now, I'm, being, I'm being careful to not say moisture because moisture content is going to be a, a specific term, but that would be the weight of the water. Does that make sense? 
you know, the weight before uh, oven curing and the weight after curing would be the weight of the water. Everybody okay with that? Now, I would say dry is the most, one of the most important uh, moisture states. This is also one of the uh, most important uh, moisture states. This is called uh, saturated surface dry. Saturated surface dry is when the voids are filled completely and the surface uh, is dry. So you can see I've got this aggregate. The voids are filled, but I really don't have any free moisture on the outside. Like if I have a very, very moist sample, it would be indicative of having free moisture on the outside. So that's sort of the difference between uh, a saturated surface dry condition and a moist condition is the moist condition has excess water. If you have a sample that's just sort of hanging out, uh, you know, in a stockpile and it's essentially dry, we probably would want to define that as air dry. It probably has some amount of water inside the sample, but we really don't know how much. And that's when you would go weigh it, put it in the oven, dry it, weigh it again, and specifically determine the amount of water inside that sample. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Make sure that you have a clear understanding of the four moisture states. That's a big one uh, that might be worth uh, discussing on a given exam, the four moisture states uh, of a given uh, sample of aggregate. Do I need to hold it on here for a sec or everybody good? Okay. Now, I'm going to hold it here for a sec because I really want to make sure that this uh, is clear. So some important terminology to uh, recognize. I'm actually going to kind of start at the bottom and maybe kind of work my way up. Um, the first concept that I really want you to understand is what's called moisture content. So I might call it moisture content. I might call it water content. Okay. So what I was saying earlier is I said I'm being careful not to use that word moisture before because I want you to understand what I mean by moisture content. Moisture content is defined as the weight of water divided by the weight of the, the, the sample, the, the dry weight of the sample. So in a laboratory setting, the way that we would determine that is to determine the weight of the water, we would determine the wet weight and the dry weight and take the difference. Does that make sense? So if this is 600 and this is 580 grams, and there was 20 grams of water. So 20 grams of water divided by 580, and if we multiply by 100 to get into a percentage, um, that would be the, um, the percentage of uh, moisture content or water content. So moisture contents or water contents are written as a percentage. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, if you understand that, so make sure you're clear on this. So W sub S in my terminology here is the weight of the solids, the dry weight uh, of the sample. W sub W is the weight of the water. So W is just the total weight, however much the dry uh, weight is and however much water uh, is in the sample. Everybody okay with that? I'm, I'm, I'm holding off to talk a little bit uh, about this up here. I just want to make sure everybody's clear on, on that formula. Okay. If you're good on that, then I want to introduce a nub, a, another term, and the other term I want, you in, I want to introduce is absorption. Okay. Now, going back to this, would you agree that the moisture content of this is zero? There's no moisture, right? And even mathematically, you know, the weight of the water minus the weight of the solids, there's no water, right? So the moisture content here is zero. But would you agree that each of these have different moisture contents because they have different amounts of water? Make sense? Okay. This one is special, okay? And, and I keep going back to this because this is the moisture content where the voids are filled but the surface is dry, okay? We have a specific name for it. We call it the saturated surface dry condition. We have a specific name for this moisture uh, content, this moisture state. The moisture content at the saturated surface dry condition, we have a name for that. We call it the absorption. The absorption is the moisture content at the saturated surface dry condition. Make sense? So free moisture, free moisture is the moisture in excess of saturated surface dry. So here's free moisture. 
the moisture content of this excess water is the free moisture. Okay, and we would determine that by taking the, the moisture content total minus the moisture content in the saturated surface dry condition. Does that make sense? That matters because it's possible that our percent of free moisture could be positive or it could be negative. Okay? Negative would be indicative of something like the second condition where we've got some empty space in those voids that can be filled uh, with water. So the aggregate is going to absorb water. If that is positive, that, uh, that aggregate is going to give off water uh, to the cement paste. So it's, it's an important concept to remember later on when we're mixing concrete. We need to understand what the moisture state of that aggregate is when we begin mixing. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. You may leave it up here for a sec. I could have said something like tough, we're moving on. No. I'm such a nice guy, aren't I? <laughs> Everybody good? Okay. So let me go back. So I'm going back to these moisture states, and I want to sort of mathematically define what's going on. Now let me be clear. I'm calculating moisture contents, you know, like in the air dry condition, in the moist condition, or what have you. And they look like they're the same formula. While they are the same formula, they would give you different answers because we have different amounts of water. There's different amounts of water here than there is over here. So while you're using the same formula, because the amount of water change, you'd get a, you'd get a different answer. Now again, we are still taking the total weight minus the dry weight divided by the dry weight to get moisture content. This is the only one that has a very special name. So again, we're taking total weight minus dry weight divided by dry weight to get a moisture content. But again, this one is special. It has its own special name for that moisture content. We call that absorption. So that's why that one is listed with an A and all the others are just a generic water content because that one's special. Okay? Does that make sense? And again, you can do the math over here, but it doesn't matter because it's dry. There is no water. Water content zero. So again, this isn't so bad, right? I mean, conceptually, it's pretty straightforward. Yes. Yes, they are. And I know I said I was, uh, I, you asked instructional analysis to turn them on early. I turned them on early in structural analysis. I just forgot to do that here. But we're going to be on these notes for a couple days, so this should be good. But these notes, as well as some handouts we're going to use later, have all just been turned on. So apologies for, get, for forgetting that. But you should be good for the next couple days. Yeah. That's a good reason. <laughs> all right. Everybody good? OK. Let's look at a little example. Um, I don't even think I need to pull up a. Uh, uh, I don't even think I need to pull up a, a, a notebook or whatnot because we're probably going to be able to do this right in this uh, this white space right here. But given the following information, I want to determine the total moisture content and the free moisture content of the following sample. So I have a, a sample. The moist mass of the sample is about 625 grams. The dry mass is around 590 grams. Now, um, we mentioned this in lab last week, and I, and I wanted to, to mention this again. How do you determine the mass of a sample? Well, in order to do that, you have to weigh the sample in some container and then subtract the weight of that container. Okay? So just be aware of that. Okay? So this is the actual just weight of the sample. So think. The samples in the container has been weighed, and then the empty container has been weighed, and the, that's the difference. Okay? So we have a moist mass and a dry mass, and we also have already determined the absorption. So I need to determine the total moisture content and the free moisture content. Okay? Make sense? And I think you'll see as we follow along, this is really simple. So, so watch this. Would you agree that in terms of the data that we were given, would you agree that the, the weight, the total weight of this sample 
is the 625.2 grams and the weight of the solids, the, the dry weight, is 589.9 grams. Do you agree with that? Pretty straightforward, right? So, if you have that data, how would we determine the moisture content of the sample? We're not determining absorption or anything like that. We're just determining a, uh, a moisture content because we just know that the sample's moist. We don't know that it's in its saturated surface dry condition. We just know that it has some element of moisture. So how would we determine that? There you go. So the water content, so W sub C, is W minus W sub S over W sub S. And then to turn that into a percentage, uh, let me do better than that. To turn that into a percentage, we multiply that by 100%. Can you all read that? I know it's coming out a little thin, but can you all read that? Okay. All right. So we have 625.2 grams minus 589.9 grams divided by 589.9 grams. So think. The difference between those two is the amount of water. So the amount of water divided by the amount of aggregate. And we'll say to two decimal places, that's close enough. 5.98%. Um, anytime I get calculations done in my class, I usually like to uh, ask if somebody else got the same answer. So I'll say, do I have a second on that? Do I have a second on that? All right, there we go, 5.98%. Now, let me ask you uh, a question, okay? I'm going to go back a slide. Do you, based on that number, is our sample more like this one over here on the right? or more like this one. Again, it's an unknown moisture state, so it, e it could either have excess moisture or it could have empty voids. Is it going to be more like this or more like this? It's going to be moist, right? Because the moisture state here in the saturated surface dry condition is only 1.6%. So it has excess moisture, okay? How do we determine that excess moisture? We just take the difference. So. Therefore, the free moisture, so we'll say free water content, is just the water content minus the absorption, which is 5.98% minus 1.6%, which equals, what is that, 4.38%. So that would definitely matter if we were using this aggregate for some component, let's say an ingredient in concrete. If it already had some initial moisture, we would need to know that so we don't add too much water when we mix that concrete. Too, uh, excess water increases your workability, but it will decrease your strength. So that matters. It'll lower that FC prime. for those of you who've had concrete. Right. Any questions about that? This isn't too bad, is it? This is simple stuff. You want me to leave this up here for a second? Okay. Okay. Now, let's start talking about some other properties. If you understand that example and just moisture contents in general, it's really that's really all there is to it. I mean, you might get asked some, you might be given some different values and have to work around some equations to get some different answers, but that, that's about it. That's about as complicated as it gets. Now let's talk about specific gravity. Now, specific gravity is, the again, the ratio of a substance density or its unit weight uh, to the density or unit weight of water. So just so everybody's aware, the density of water in SI is one gram per milliliter. Uh, or in U.S. units is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Um, 
if there was one number that was drilled into my head other than pi, probably by the time I had finished with a civil engineering degree, it was that water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. That's just one of those numbers that I think graduating with a civil engineering degree, you just need to remember. That and the Young's modulus of steel is 29,000 KSI. You got to know that number. Just have to. Um, but yeah, again, we're, essentially what we're talking about is the ratio of an element's uh, unit weight to the unit weight of water. Now again, unit weight is defined as weight per unit volume. So we're going to talk about that here in a second. Um, what makes this complicated is moisture content. You know, we've got voids. So the unit weight or the specific gravity of a given element of aggregate can change dependent upon its moisture content. We can have specific gravity uh, in its dry state. We can have specific gravity in its saturated surface dry state. Um, we can also, uh, uh, specific gravity can change depending upon its compaction. Remember in the lab, there were two boxes of aggregate, right? One of them was loose and one of them was compacted. That was the same aggregate. But because that aggregate was arranged in different conditions, it felt as if it had a different unit weight. So it's, it's definitely, uh, it definitely is worth mentioning. Now, there is a standard test method for determining the specific weight of coarse aggregate. I'm going to run through it with you uh, uh, here in a second. I'll show you some images. But essentially, uh, it involves, like if you're trying to determine the specific gravity of a coarse aggregate, Essentially, it involves comparing uh, its weight in, uh, in a given condition uh, to its weight when the element is submerged in water. So uh, you know, you're essentially going to be determining three weights throughout a laboratory procedure. It's dry weight, it's saturated surface dry weight, and it's submerged weight. Uh, it's kind of difficult, to be honest, it's kind of difficult to, um, to weigh uh, or to, de to determine an aggregate saturated surface dry condition in a laboratory. There's a, a pretty simplified method that's used in the laboratory, and it essentially involves saturating some aggregate and then essentially patting them dry uh, with a towel. I know it seems sort of like, isn't there a better way of doing it? Not a better and simpler way, I guess, would be the best way of putting that. But essentially, we're going to uh, determine three unit weights, the weight of the aggregate when it's uh, dry, the weight of the aggregate in its saturated surface dry condition, and then the weight of the aggregate when it's been submerged. So you'll essentially have a tank of water uh, over some scale. You'll have uh, a bin with some aggregate, submerge it, and then you'll be able to, uh, to determine that unit weight. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll try. I think this is one that we'll be able to do in lab. Um, some of them we're going to do, and some of them we're not. I'm still not 100% sure if I want to do the um, uh, the, specific, or the, the, uh, yeah, the specific gravity for fine aggregate, the, the laboratory experiment can be a little touchy and it can take a little longer. It essentially involves uh, submerging your aggregate in this, uh, what's called a pinkometer. Um, so you, you have to, you, the experiment again, it gets a little uh, touchier. We might at the very least do a demonstration for you in the lab just so you all have a general idea uh, of how it's done. <laughs> One thing I should also point out, I found some really nifty uh, links on YouTube that actually show step-by-step step how these uh, laboratory experiments are, are done. It would be a good idea on your own time to watch these videos before you come to lab so that you don't come to lab completely sort of lost what's going on. I mean, the video, they're only like five or ten minutes long, but they're, um, they're a really good intro for what we're going to be doing in lab before you actually get in lab. Again. Uh, most of these experiments are ones that we are going to do uh, together. Everybody good? Okay. A few quick words on aggregate sampling. Um, we mentioned just sampling in general last time, but we would like our aggregate sampling to be random uh, and representative. We try and do our best to uh, sample uh, from multiple locations to really try and get a representative uh, sample of that aggregate. You know, for instance, sampling from the top, the middle, and the bottom uh, of the stockpile, um, sampling from the entire width of the conveyor belts to sort of uh, uh, to get a representative uh, notion of what's going on. There are some sampling methods that are worth mentioning. Uh, for instance, we actually have one of these in the lab. It's called a sample splitter. You'll take a given sample, place it uh, in this upper bin, 
And what the sample splitter does is it essentially randomly splits that sample into two separate uh, bins, and then you'll only take uh, uh, one of them. Another way of, of, of achieving a quote-unquote random or, and representative sample, uh, sample is to do what's called quartering. You'll essentially lay your sample out on you know, some fabric or some tarp or something like that. And you can either use something like a trowel or a shovel to actually uh, divide that up into four quarters, if you will, or you can use uh, a template like this. And you'll essentially divide that up and you'll take opposing quarters, you know, maybe you'll take this one and take that one, and discard the rest. Again, it's, it's, it's uh, the idea of removing that human bias from the, uh, the collection of that sample as much as possible. Honestly, we probably won't worry in lab about actually going through the process of doing that. I'll show you all the sample uh, splitter in lab so that you all see it and understand how it works. But again, I'm more interested in you all understanding how to appropriately do the experiment and how to appropriately uh, collect that data. Um, Everybody okay with that? Okay. Make sure when you're handling aggregate that you're doing your best not to let it, um, uh, you know, not to let it degrade or segregate or contaminate. You're making sure you're separating all your components with uh, similar uh, characteristics. You know, if you've got an aggregate, don't take it and you know throw it across the room. I mean, you're trying to determine the gradation uh, of a given aggregate, so you have to sort of treat it like it's a laboratory sample because guess what? It is. So just make sure. Your, your aggregate sample with care. Uh, don't uh, drop it from large heights. Um, make sure you uh, keep everything separate uh, and, and avoid contamination, uh, obviously, uh, 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 whenever possible. Um, okay, everybody good? Right. So let's talk about unit weight. Um, unit weight, um, again, uh, it, it can be sort of a, a loose definition with something like this. Again, I go back to that uh, uh, moment we had in the lab where we had two boxes of the same aggregate, but because one was a little looser and one was a little more compact, they had different weights. So uh, what I'm going to do is, is uh, introduce you to what's called a bulk unit weight. It's just sort of a simplified term for what I mean by unit weight, literally just the weight divided by uh, some volume. And I know there's going to be voids and whatnot in there, so we, we do need to talk about how uh, that is handled. Um, what I mean by loose aggregate uh, in the lab is basically literally just aggregate that's been placed into the, uh, the container with no regard for compaction uh, or anything like that. So first off, we are talking about dry aggregate. Um, we are going to try and control the behavior of that aggregate a little bit. So if we have our container, I have here where we're limiting the drop calling drop to less than two inches. So the idea is if I have my container, just don't just dump. The idea is to kind of place that into the container. That's why we have that limit of a drop less than two inches. So we have some container. We'll fill it to the brim with aggregate. Use something like a two by four or some uh, flat element to strike off the top. Has anybody ever done any work with concrete where you're striking or something like that? That's what I mean by striking off. Determine the weight of the container, and then obviously you have to have the weight of the container. Take the difference of those two, weight divided by volume. That'll get you what I'm calling a loose unit weight. Now, how many of you all um, did any cylinder testing or whatnot over the summer? I saw a couple of you did that. Is that how you place concrete in a cylinder? No. No. How do you place concrete in a cylinder? What's that? Lifts. Three lifts, right? Three lifts, and then you use a rod and you tamp it how many times? 25 times. Okay. So for those of you who ha are new to this process, when you prepare uh, concrete cylinder samples for testing, this is something we will do in the lab, um, you're basically taking wet concrete and pouring it inside a cylindrical mold that will then cure and you will test for its compressive strength. You do not just take concrete and pour it in the mold and call it a day. You have to take that concrete and appropriately place it inside that mold. The appropriate uh, procedure to do that is you, uh, um, you pour or place that concrete in the mold in what are called three lifts. So essentially, if you've got a cylinder, you would, and I'm, I'm using concrete, but really this, the, if you're trying to get a compacted unit weight, the, the, the procedure is very similar. So the first thing that you would do is you would place that uh, concrete in what's called three lifts. So you'll start off filling it to about a third of the way full. Okay, 
And then you'll have a large metal rod, metal rod, it's called a tamping rod, and you basically go in and tamp that, tamp that, uh, that, uh, that sample in the mold. And you do that a total of 25 times. And that's meant to try and shake up some of the voids, the air voids uh, and whatnot inside the sample to get that concrete to settle down. Once you've done that 25 times, pour another third. Do it again 25 times. Pour another third. Do it 25 times. Strike it off and then you've got a compacted sample as opposed to a loose sample. Make sense? I, I promise you your unit weight of that compact sample is going to be different than the unit weight of that loose sample. The compact sample is going to be heavier guaranteed because you're taking up more of those voids with more aggregate. I promise you aggregate weighs more than air. Okay. Well, it's true. All right. Make sense? Okay. All right. So another uh, aspect or another computation that's really important in this aggregate, I mean, it's easy to determine unit weight. Take a weight, take a volume, divide them. You're done. Um, what, is, what is also incredibly important is to determine within a given sample how much material there is and how many voids there are. So to walk through the math with you, if I have some volume uh, of aggregate, I mean, and this is true for a number of different materials, but since we're talking about aggregate, if I have some box and it's full of aggregate, like remember the box that we had in the lab, you would agree that some of that box was filled with aggregate and some of it was filled with air, right? It wasn't 100% completely filled with aggregate. I mean, and, and my analogy is almost think about the box that was full of water. That was completely water, right? And there might have been some bubbles, but they rose to the surface and, and popped, and it was full, completely 100% with water. But the aggregate box, there was stone, but then there was also some, some voids there. So within a given box, there's going to be a, um, there's going to be a weight or a volume of solids and a volume of voids. So the percent solids, the percent of solids within a given sample, I propose is the volume of solids divided by volume total. In other words, that box of aggregate, it was one cubic foot, it was, maybe it was something like 0.8 cubic feet of actual stone, of aggregate stone, and the rest was air. Now, so the volume of solids divided by the volume total. Well, I, I propose that the um, volumes are nothing more than the weights uh, divided by the unit weight, so W divided by gamma. So the weight of the solids divided by the unit weight of the solids, and then the weight of the solids divided by the bulk unit weight. The, re the reason why I'm doing that is because A, I can cancel out the weight of solids, and then all I need in order to perform this computation is the bulk unit weight, which is really easy to determine, just weight divided by volume, and then the specific gravity. So if I've got the specific gravity, and I've got the, uh, the bulk unit weight, I can determine the percent, uh, the percent volume of solids and then also the percent voids. If I've got the percent of solids, like if it's 70% solids, it'd be 30% voids, just the difference between the two. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? And we need an accurate representation of that because, you know, um, it's easy to determine weight, but we also need to determine volume too. You know, for instance, if you're placing concrete, how many of you ever heard the term replacing so many yards of concrete? Well, we're talking about a volume. I mean, we can weigh things fairly easily in the lab. We can fairly easily determine weights, but we also need an accurate means to determine volume. And I propose that one of the easiest ways to do that, once you've got your weights, is to use the specific gravity. So that's what I have right here. So let's look at that. All right? So I have here a uh, I have here a sample. Now let's look at the uh, the following information. So I want to determine the unit weight and I want to determine the percent volume of voids. I want to try and characterize as much as I can about the given sample. And again, we you know, we need to understand the info about the sample because we hope that the sample is representative of the material as a whole. So let's determine the bulk unit weight and the percent volume of voids of the following sample. So I have a mold that I'm saying is one third cubic feet. Imagine one of those boxes that's only filled up for the, that's essentially what we're talking about. Um, 
Now I have the tear of the mold and then the weight of the tear and the coarse aggregate. And what I mean by that is the tear is the container. So the container itself weighs 21 pounds and the weight of the tear and the coarse aggregate is 59.2. So how am I going to determine the weight of the aggregate? Subtract the two, right? Now I've got the specific gravity of the aggregate that I did using uh, uh, the experiment that was mentioned before. And I've got a bulk specific gravity of about 2.6. So using that, I want to be able to determine uh, the bulk unit weight and the percent volume of void. So let's go through this. So first off, would you agree that the weight of, we'll say the weight of the solids, is going to be 59.2 pounds minus 21 pounds? Would you agree with that? Everybody okay with that? So subtract those two and what do you get? Was that 38? 38.2? 38 okay. Excuse me. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so we also have the volume. The volume is one-third cubic feet. Now, if you want, you can say that's 0 0.33 cubic feet. That's fine. So I propose that the bulk unit weight gamma sub b is just the weight over the volume. So 38.2 pounds divided by 0 0.33 cubic feet. And if you know your fractions, all we got to do is take that and multiply it by 3, right? So what's 38.2 times 3? No, he's making us do calculations. Say it again. 124.6. 114. See, that's why I do the second. Yeah. And don't worry, I'll have um, mistakes in my calculations as well. Um, but. Marshall University policy says I'm allowed seven mistakes per semester. It was a joke, not a very funny one. But then again, I'm the one that's keeping track of the mistakes, so it's pretty one-sided, I know. What's that? 6.3 mistakes, so, yeah. It was sick. <laughs> again, just, just, you know, got to have some levity in all of this. Okay. So, so. We've got that the unit weight, so I'm going to sort of write this over here. So first off, this is going to be one of my answers right here. That's the bulk unit weight of this material. Now again, bulk unit weight, again, it depends on loose, compact, so something that you need to kind of, I would say, take a little bit with a grain of salt, but it's definitely something you need to understand the context. Now, now that'll tell us how much this material weighs, but we also need a, a, an accurate understanding uh, for this representative sample how much of that volume is solid and how much of it is voids. And again, that really matters when you're proportioning concrete mixes. We really, we really need to understand that. And also for bases and drainage and things like that. So we've got our unit weight, which is 114.6 pounds per cubic foot. We also have, I can do better than that. We also have our unit weight of water which is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Okay? Now, we have, we also, we have one more quantity. We know that our specific gravity is 2.63. So, what we can do really simply is we can determine the percent, and I, I'm just going to use the percent simple since I'm lazy, the percent of solids by essentially taking the unit weight, the bulk unit weight, divided by what I'll call the adjusted unit weight, which is just taking the unit weight of water and multiplying it by that bulk specific gravity. So what do we have? We have 114.6. divided by 2.63 
times 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And honestly, what I need to do here is I need to take this and I need to multiply it by 100% because I'm going to get a decimal. It's going to come out to be like, you know, 0.7 something. So I want it in a percent. So I'm going to multiply by 100. So what does this come out to be? 69.83. Do I have a second on that? All right. Awesome. Okay. So if that's the percent of, of solids in this particular sample, so what do we have? About 70% solid? So if it's about 70% solid, how much of it is air? About 30%. And how would we determine that? 100 minus that, right? So what's the percent voids? So it's 100% minus 69.83. What does that come out to be? What's that? 30 point what? 1 7. Second on that? Okay, all right. So uh, it might seem like the calculations that we're doing are a little random and a little all over the place, but I, what, I, what I really want to get across is this. The idea that with just a few weights and, and specific gravities of a representative sample of aggregate, we can completely characterize the relationship between the weight of that aggregate and the volume of that aggregate. And that's going to be incredibly important if you're going to take that aggregate and use it for a base or a filler material or an ingredient for something like concrete. You have to be able to understand that relationship in order to appropriately use that material for a civil engineering application. Does that make sense? And again, if you're like specific gravity or, or these lab experiments, we're going to do these together. So, so don't worry. Um, I think some of the magic behind well, what's, you know, how do we determine these specific gravity uh, values, that's going to sort of wash away as we do these experiments in the lab. Yes, sir? Uh, what does the 62.4 uh, point work? That's a good question. The 62.4 pounds per cubic foot is, is a standard value. It's like this. Where does 9.81 meters per second squared come from? That's just it. You know, that's just the acceleration due to gravity. What I'm saying is if you have a box that is one by one by one foot, and you pour, fill it with water, that water will weigh 62.4 pounds. That is, that is constant associated with water. That's a good question. So that's one of those things that you'll want to sort of you know, toss in your memory or throw on a formula sheet for, for an exam. That won't change. Um, yes? The bulk specific gravity. Okay, so let me go. Easiest way to explain is to go go back a little bit. If we're talking about um, uh, a, if we're talking about a, a, a coarse aggregate, the bulk specific gravity is essentially a comparison of the dry unit weight to, to um, uh, a weight that's essentially submerged. We're essentially trying to take an aggregate's dry unit weight and compare it with an equivalent weight of water. And the way that we do that is we take the difference of the uh, aggregates weight in the dry condition or in the saturated surface dry condition and then submerge. And that difference between those two will give us sort of a comparable moisture weight. So if we take that dry weight divided by that quantity, it sort of gives us a representative bulk specific gravity of the sample. By submerging it, we're, we're doing our best to sort of remove the effects of voids in the particular sample. Does that make sense? Because those voids would sort of be filled with water, so by weighing it in that submerged condition, that doesn't affect it as much. Does, it, does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? That's a good question. Okay. Everybody else okay with that? This is good stuff. Again, please, if you've got these questions, I mean, this is important stuff. I want to make sure that you understand it. I think one of the nice things about this is while this is important, it's not incredibly difficult. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Anything else? Okay. I want to briefly, I know we're sort of running short on time. I want to briefly introduce the concept of a sieve analysis. 
we're sort of making great time. I, I was, I thought we may or may not get to sieve analyses today, but since we're here, we've got a little bit of time, I want to introduce this. So a sieve analysis is one of the most important, arguably, I'd argue it is the most important characterization of an aggregate that you will do. I mean, when I took construction materials back in 2005, whew, yeah, I know, I, and, I, and I found out that I was teaching this class for the first time, and I went back, you know, trying to remember what did I do in that class. This was the one thing I remembered doing in this class was the sieve analysis, that, that and the cylinder testing. But this is one of the most fundamental characterizations that you can do of a given aggregate. And here's the general idea. So when we use aggregate, we're going to use it you know, for a specific purpose. Let's say concrete, or let, let's use concrete as an example. When we design a, a concrete mix, we're essentially going to be saying this many parts gravel, this many parts sand, this many parts cement, and this many parts water, uh, and et cetera. But in order to do that, we are assuming that whatever this, like, you know, I say, you know, this many parts sand, we are assuming that that aggregate adheres to the specifications that defines sand. In other words, for me to be able to use that aggregate for a specific uh, application like concrete, it's got to meet certain specifications. And the biggest specification that it's got to meet is whether or not the size of those particles makes sense. That's where sieve analysis comes into play. Now, I said, you know, in general, a coarse aggregate is that is which is retained on the number four sieve, and a fine aggregate is what passes the number four uh, sieve. But that's not enough. We have to characterize that aggregate and characterize its different sizes uh, with the use of a sieve analysis. Um, the end product of a sieve analysis will look, will be plotted on something like this. This is why I was saying next time you definitely want to bring a straight edge because we're going to be plotting on a grain size distribution graph. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to kind of show you what a, what a plot will look like. The plot will end up looking something like this. So you'll see uh, a given sample, and you'll see the sieve analysis. This is the one in the middle. This would be the result of data that we obtained from the lab. So looking at different sieves, we're essentially trying to determine how much material passes through given sieves. The main purpose of that is we would then plot that against the specification. So this is the specification uh, for fine aggregate for concrete. So these two blue lines would represent the upper and lower limits for what is allowed for a given, uh, uh, a given aggregate. So for instance, the percent passing the number four sieve would have to be somewhere between 95% and 100%. The percent passing the number eight would have to be somewhere between 80 and 100%. So you get these sort of bounds for a given fine aggregate. The idea is if I test a sample, what I want to have happen is that it falls within these bounds and i.e. meets the specifications. That's what I want to happen. If it doesn't happen, then I've got to take these two aggregates or, or take this aggregate and another aggregate and maybe blend them together uh, in order to meet specifications. So I'm going to show you all how to uh, perform a sieve analysis and then how to blend two aggregates in order to meet uh, given specification, but this is the general idea behind what it is that we're doing. So next time what we're going to do is we're going to conduct a sieve analysis. I'm going to give you all a representative set of data. I want everybody to pay attention to this. I'm going to, what's that? Oh. Uh, I'm going to give you all a representative set of data, okay? I'm going to teach you all how to perform the sieve analysis, and then when you all get in lab, you're going to collect your own data and do a sieve analysis on that data as well. So this is what we're going to be. This is what we're going to focus on next time. So make sure you bring a straight edge. Also make sure you bring closed-toed shoes. Also one last thing: uh, if you haven't already done so by Thursday, elect that group representative to have access to the lab and give me that name by Thursday. Sound good? That's all I got. I will see you all on Thursday.